Hi, and welcome to the 603 Podcast, where we explore the people, places, and things that create the culture of New Hampshire. This podcast educates, motivates, and discovers the stories that shape the Granite State and its impact on the country and the world. Hi, everybody. I'm extreme sports pioneer Dan Egan and your host of the 603 Podcast. I'm excited about this podcast for so many reasons. First, to share the stories. Second, to meet and get to know the people who create, share, and develop the activities, businesses, and iconic history of our state, but also to hear from you, our listeners, about the stories and ideas you think that we should share on our podcast. You can check out our website at 603podcast.com to learn more about our guests and to share with us your stories and ideas of people who you think we should interview. The 603 Podcast is sponsored by Mad River Coffee Roasters. Your adventure starts and stops here. MadRiverCoffeeRoasters.com Waterville Valley Resort, New Hampshire's family resort. Online at Waterville.com Jeans Playhouse in Lincoln, New Hampshire. Check out their summer schedule at JeansPlayhouse.com And Ski Fanatics, your one-stop shop for year-round adventure at SkiFanatics.net Our guest this episode on the 603 Podcast is Dave Groper owner of Cinnamon Rainbow Surf Shop right here in New Hampshire. Dave is a New Hampshire beach bum. That's right, a lifelong New Hampshire surfer who bought the surf shop he worked at right after high school in 1989 on the seacoast. He has taken his dreams and passion and grown surfing here in New Hampshire to a thriving year-round surfing destination. The Cinnamon Rainbow longtime location was severely damaged by smoke of a nearby restaurant fire in 2022. We caught up with Dave via phone from his new temporary location in Northampton, New Hampshire. Let's dive right in and catch up and learn more about the surfing craze right here in New Hampshire. Dave, how you doing? Doing great, Dan. How are you? Uh, I'm doing good, man. I'm loving the springtime weather here. It really feels like, you know, it's going to be a good summer. But for you, you're coming off a mild winter. What, What was that like? Yeah, um, well, it's nice. Days are getting longer and sun's getting stronger. The water's warming up. It was somewhat of a mild winter, but we had consistent surf. So we've been surfing year round. I'm looking forward to uh, summer. Love it. Well done. How's that? How does the tide play a role here in New Hampshire on our surf? So the tide plays a big role because obviously there's a swing every six, just about every six hours. It's a pretty big tidal swing. So depending on where you're going, you need to have the local knowledge of what breaks, you know, we what breaks best at what tides. Some of the tides are low tide breaks. Some are better at high tides. A lot of variables come into play. But for example, North Beach in Hampton, best at low to mid and at high tide, it gets so full, the surf sort of shuts off. Yeah, that's really a you know, one important information to have, right? And uh, I I imagine it takes a while for surfers to figure that out. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it, a lot of learning how to surf is also just learning how to um, kind of become an amateur meteorologist and knowing when the weather and the surf is going to be good and knowing where to go and when. The winds, the tides, the swell all play such a pivotal role, much like skiers are with like looking for, you know, the snowstorms and the winds and stuff, the, uh, the surf the same way. You know, when you think of surfing uh, and the lore and the legends of surfing, New Hampshire's not high on that list usually, but describe the surfing here and why it's so good and how it's become so popular. So there's a few things behind that. One, I believe the popularity of surfing is the um, technology of wetsuit. You know, it's cold here, and the, the technology and the access to get gear has never been better. It's never been easier. It's never been more affordable. There's more people surfing. You know, the shops, there's shops on almost every beach with waves now, so you have access to equipment, forecasting. We had, You know, we used to have to check the surf or watch the, watch the weather to find out what the winds were going to do, and now we have a live wave camera on our website where you can watch the waves in real time. And there's plenty of accurate surf forecasting sites. And then this area, it's just a beautiful place to surf. Uh, we have sand bottom beach breaks and rock bottom point breaks. And it's a pretty amazing community. It's a beautiful, fun place to be. And it's just getting more popular every year. Absolutely. Uh, And you're introducing always new surfers into the sport. Talk to me about, you know, when the UNH 
uh, student shows up at your shop and he's he's new to it, but wants to get into it? What's the process for you know kids that are out of state and have heard about it? So the best thing to do when you want to learn how to surf is is to either get a lesson or go with someone with some knowledge, so that you can like uh you want one you want to be safe and you know you want to know the etiquette the rules of the road. And you want to make sure that you go out on the right conditions and have the right equipment. You definitely need a little bit of help to get pointed in the right direction. So either go to a lesson, uh, get a surf lesson through a shop, or, you know, go in um, with someone that's experienced that can show you the ropes to get started in the right direction. And does that, you know, sort of come down to the equipment and the choices you make, or is there a beginner board or, you know, or... Does that depend on the type of surfer I hope to become? Yeah, a lot of the times it depends on. I'd say the the couple things that to set yourself up to set yourself up for surfing. The biggest thing is you're going to need to go out on the right day. You want to go out on a day where you know it's not windy and choppy. On a day when there's big enough surf to get some rides, but small enough so you're not going to get throttled. You want to have a board that's big enough so that you can stand on and get some rides, but also you know, small enough so that you can paddle it out through the white water. You don't want to paddle out 10 feet and get knocked back 11 feet, you know, like, so having the right, going out on the right day, having the right equipment and going to the right spot, all play pivotal roles in your success. Dave, what, uh, what was the hook for you? When did you get hooked on surfing and how did it start? I grew up in Hampton. My daughter is actually fifth generation in our house. My great grandfather was a lifeguard here, and I I grew up I grew up on the beach here. I just loved to body surf when I was a kid and spent time in the water. And then I loved had my uncle had had this old like sort of foam surfboard that I played around on. And it wasn't until I was about eleven or twelve where I started borrowing some real surfboards and getting hooked. And at that point in time, there were no shops in the area, so it was a little a little bit difficult getting gear. Then I finally traded for a surfboard and ordered a wetsuit. And then Cinnamon Rainbows moved into town as a satellite shop. And, you know, I've pretty much been surfing regularly ever since. The first winter I ever surfed, I was uh, 15 years old. That was the time I got a winter wetsuit and surfed year round. And that was a big deal. Yeah. I mean, you're born and bred uh, New Hampshire beach bum, not a combination we hear a lot of. (laughs) Yeah, no, I really, again, I feel so fortunate. Like I started, I, I fell in love with surfing at a young age. I started working at the surf shop when, you know, when I was in high school. Um, it was a satellite shop from Cape Cod. And then, uh, I took it over just a couple years after high school in uh, 1989. And, uh, I've been doing it ever since. Wow. So you, uh, born and bred, raised on the beach, got involved and, bought the shop you worked at? How, 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 how did you put all that together? <laughs> That's the story for another day, but it was like uh, not taking no for an answer and just, you know, uh, having a vision and sticking to it. Yeah. And a lot of times, you know, back then too, it was like, there's no way it's in New Hampshire, you know, like that'll never work. And, you know, if you're passionate about something, you just stick with it. And now it's it's pretty amazing to see where we started and, you know, where we are. And I'm so proud of this uh, surf community in our town. It's amazing. Yeah. And I mean, 1989, um, and you're a young man with the vision that this thing is going to work. Uh, but a lot has changed since then. Uh, what was the hardcore community then? What, what did it look like in 1989? I'd say it's just, it was smaller core group. Everyone sort of knew everybody and they're really, it really hasn't changed that much other than the fact that it's just a lot bigger. You know, there's just more people out, more people out. There's more people out year round. When I started surfing, there there really wasn't a lot of people surfing through the winter because the seats weren't as accessible. They really weren't up to speed as well. Now you can surf through a winter comfortably. Now I would say there's a, there's a, you know, thriving year round surf community. Like you can go on a day when the waves are good in the winter, you can find a hundred people out in the water. Yeah, that's that's always amazing to me, and uh, my friends that do it swear by it. Growing up uh, myself, you know, and hearing stories about surf and sort of the secret stash and people wanting to protect their their break uh, and being aggressive about it, is that our culture here, or are we completely different from that? Well, no. Uh, 
I'd say, yeah, there, there are, sto- you know, there are stories, there are certain areas where you can have localism and such, but here, not so much, but it's also, I would say it's, it's like anywhere else as far as if you're disrespectful, you could get called out, you know, but if you show respect, you get respect, you know, there's not, I wouldn't say there's any non-welcoming localism. It's just, you just have to play by the rules so that everyone stays safe and enjoys things. It can get competitive, but it, I'd say friendly competitive. And of course, surfing is a thrill and, and it must be amazing. But as a boy, as that 15 year old who just got his, you know, wetsuit and gonna surf all winter, and do you recall some waves or the day that you were like, this is it for me? I'm in. <laughs> like, yeah. Do you have memories of that? Yeah. I mean, there's definitely, I, I have a lot of moments actually from, um, as a kid and a a lot of times people ask, I've been really lucky as far as being able to surf like all over the world. And everyone asks, you know, what are, what's your favorite place? And there's really nothing like those good days at home when it gets, when the waves get really good here and it's in your backyard and the weather and the surf all lines up, you know, that's, and that's where some of my best surf memories are. are, They're up here. Yeah, I mean that's that's huge, right? That's and do you think that's a combination of the waves, the culture, and being at home? I think so. Yeah, I think it's like probably the same way for you. You know, you've skied all the places, but those ones that are true to your heart maybe sometimes are the ones that are in your backyard on those epic days, right? Yeah, you know, I I love that because you know we all know that on the right day in the winter, Cannon or Wildcat. Nothing can match it, right? If uh, yeah, you know, and there's probably six or seven days of winter where that that happens, and if you're there on that day, it's super special and hard to explain. Yeah, and I think that's the parallel between the the ski, you know, the Northeast ski community and the surf community is those special days are a little fewer and further between, you know, farther between, so you appreciate them almost a little bit more. So, Dave, you know, you're uh, you're a young guy just out of high school and you buy a surf shop, were you nervous? Were you scared? What's that process? You looking back on it, uh, not, I was such a believer in this, in the sport and loved it. I didn't want to do anything else. I, I, I didn't have all the answers, but, uh, I knew I was passionate and I knew I wasn't afraid, afraid to work hard. And I just believed that it was all going to, all going to work itself out. And if I was to walk into that shop your first summer in 1989, uh, take me back. What what did it look like? What were the brands? What was going on? What what were you selling? What were the hot the hot items? Well, things were I think were starting to get pretty bright at the late 80s, right? You know, <laughs> yeah, like uh, some some day glow. <laughs> There's some day glow going. Uh, we had a small rack of wetsuits, a small rack of surfboards, new and used. It was kind of a little microcosm of what we had now. We had some sunglasses and some sandals and some swimwear. I tried to have a, my vision of a surf shop just a lot smaller than where we're at now. The, the theme has really never changed, you know, um, some rental gear, some new and used gear, uh, trying to get the best selection of surfboards that we can, the best selection of wetsuits that we can, you know, and it's pretty much the same way now, only paddleboard. We sell a lot of paddleboards now as well. For you know, um, not only the ocean, but for all the for the lakes regions and stuff as well. And uh, the the companies of the day, uh, name some of those, and which ones really you know, like helped you out and stood by you. Yeah, so starting in the surf industry, uh, Quicksilver and Billabong um, were a couple of the big brands that started that we started with, and um, and for surfboards, it was Michael Barron, who's a shaper for Burn Surfboards. He was the first guy we bought boards from, and we still sell boards from him today. Uh, Channel Island Surfboards. Yeah, we've always prided ourselves with having an excellent selection of, of surfboards from manufacturers all over the world. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, sort of one of the cool things about the shop and keeps people coming back. And at the same time, there's the building of the community. So how how did you factor all that in and how did you realize what an important part that was to be successful? Yeah. Building things into the community. I always felt so supportive in our town and with the state, like as far as surfing goes, like whether we're doing events or it's, it's really been a community effort. For example, we run um, three times a year. We have an event called surfing with smiles 
and it's uh, we we teach kids with special needs how to surf. It's all volunteer. All the local surfers come out and share their time and push people into push people into waves. And the lifeguards show up after work. It's like five to seven in the evenings. I think this summer it's June twentieth, July eighteenth, and August third, five p.m. to seven p.m. down on North Beach. There's just so much love with sharing the ocean and sharing waves and getting kids in the water that might need some assistance. It's it's amazing and it's all volunteer and it's all word of, word of mouth and it's something I'm really proud of. Yeah, that's that's great and that has a lot of traction. I people have told me about that event and the impact it's had and that outreach is so critical. How how has the the beach itself changed? You know, we hear a lot about weather these days and global warming and erosion. How has the beaches that you've grew up on and surfed all these years, how have they changed and how are they being impacted? It's funny you should ask because like the the beaches, every year the sand would always change sandbars better in you know, certain spots of the beach than not. One thing that I have noticed, and I'm not sure if it's from erosion or rising sea levels, but You know, when I was a kid, the best time to surf at the wall, North Beach, was usually high tide, and we had these jetties that went out. And even at high tide, there was still usually like 10 yards of sand, you know, and a beach. And now it's like an hour before high tide, it's just right up to the wall, and it's full, you know. So, And I'm not sure if that's for just sand from sand moving around or what, but it's definitely changed a little bit for sure. Yeah, noticeably, I've I've seen that and and I've experienced that at some of my favorite beaches as well. And it's always hard to remember what it was because we're just so occupied for what it is, right? I mean, it's so the changes are subtle in that way. Exactly. Yeah. And then you're like, wow, have I been going to the beach for fifty years? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Who's counting? You know, like, Who's counting? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you know, of course, it was big news and sad news when. Uh, your shop burnt down. Uh, take me back to when that happened and what was the cause of that? There was a fire in the restaurant next door to us, and it was in August 19th. We didn't, our shop didn't really burn down, but we had smoke damage, and it was pretty significant to the point of took a few days to figure out what was, you know, is this something that you can clean up and fix or not? But turns out it was too much. The the fire, the restaurant, you know, was pretty much burned. It burned out. And we had such heavy smoke damage. Uh, the decision was to evacuate. You know, I'm going to evacuate the building and find a temporary location, and then the building will get leveled and redone, and we'll be back at the beach. It's just going to be a little bit, probably maybe summer after next or Christmas after next. But in the meantime, we found a temporary location to work, and it's so nice to not sit idle. And was that a uh, tough to shift gears like that for you? I mean, that you must have been emotionally attached to the building and and all the memories? Yeah, it it, it was uh, definitely some challenging times for sure. The the corner is obviously very sentimental. Now I'm just, you know, like the only thing you can, I guess, count on in life is uncertainty, right? The only certain things are is uncertainty. And we're just kind of rolling with it day to day. We've got a great space in Northampton that we can work out of in the meantime. And eventually we'll be back at the beach with a killer new shop for generations to enjoy. It's going to take a little bit and be a little bit of a a different path that we thought we were going to take, but it's all working itself out. Yeah, as uh, as it does. And I, I think as a surfer, you must be going with the flow, so to speak, kind of looking around, surveying the landscape and saying, okay, this is a time to kind of ride it out. Is that what's happening? Yeah, absolutely. And I definitely want to say, like, one of the biggest things is that support from the community that we received was just unbelievable. You know, like, everybody went through it together when it came to making the move and setting up the new shop. There was just so many people that offered their help and volunteered. And it's it's amazing to see, like, I've always said, like, I don't feel like we own the shop as much as we run it for the community. And that was never more apparent than through the fire and everything. And of course, you know, so much changed with COVID. We we see it in so many different industries. How did COVID affect surfing? That was pretty crazy to see the beaches closed. COVID was, yeah, COVID was a scary time, I think, for everybody. And we weren't really sure what, how things were going to go, but 
once once we opened back up, we saw a huge influx in in business. I mean, everybody wanted to go to. It seemed like people were, uh, you know, had been locked up and were were just ready to get out. So there was definitely a big uh, boom in in surfing and beach going. And since then, I think it's leveled off some. But yeah, we had a we had a slow a slow time there, and then we made up for it. You know, you talked a little bit about uh, paddle boarding, and you know that's a major trend right now. You know, and people are doing it everywhere, right? They're doing it on lakes, they're doing it on ri- oh yeah, ri- they're doing it everywhere. What's it like uh, on the beach traffic? Has it expanded your business, and are people buying boards for beach use or other use with you? So the paddle boards, yeah, no, we sell we sell boards that people are using at the beach. We also are selling boards that you know a lot of them are going to go to like lakes regions and not see any salt water. The thing I love about paddle boarding, it's a great way to enjoy the water and get some sunshine and get some exercise. You don't have to wait for waves to get you know to get out there, and it's definitely a lot of fun. Absolutely, and and catching like wildfire. I mean, since 1989 to today, to paddle boarding, you've seen a lot of trends kind of come and go, right? I mean, you know, of course, I'd throw kayaking yep. into that. What's what's next on the horizon for water sports? You know, I'm not sure, but the paddle boarding thing is definitely, is definitely here to stay. Um, we used to do some sit on, sit on top kayaks. It's funny that you say that. And then uh, it just, for me, it feels, you know, I used to love the sit sit in the kayaks, but then my back, you know, would get sore and my feet would fall asleep sometimes. So it's just so much, feels so much better standing on a board for for me. And I think a lot of people feel that way as well. It's hard to say what's next. I know one of the biggest things, the biggest boom in the surf industry lately has been the improvement of soft surf boards, you know, for kids and stuff. And it makes it really fun. You can get a foam board with rubber fins, you know, you can run into the sand and you can crash into the beach and no one's getting hurt. And it's really made made it a fun, safe, easy way for kids and, and adults to learn how to surf. Absolutely. And how about foiling? Is foiling uh, catching on here in the seacoast? Foiling is, but the learning curve is pretty tricky on foiling. So there are a few people doing it. Um, there are a few people kite foiling. There are a few people kite surfing. But it just seems, yeah, with the learning curve being a little bit more difficult, we ha- we do sell some foils, but it hasn't really taken off like the paddle boarding has. In 2007, we we sold our first paddle board, you know, our first few paddle boards, and we've been selling them ever since. And a few years years ago, we started with the foils. It's steady, but it does, hasn't seen the growth like a paddle boarding is, and I don't think it will just because of the learning curve. Yeah, there's a big learning curve, and and I also think maybe it's our it's our sea coast isn't lending itself to to that right? Um, there may be other locations where, where that's working a bit more. Yeah. And I know people, um, you know, there's like wake foil, like wake behind yeah. boats and stuff too. Right. I've actually done that. It was actually how I kind of learned how to do it. Nice. And, uh, and not that I'm proficient at it. I actually got a scar on my chest uh, or a scar on my belly from it. It's, uh, definitely if you're going to take on the foil, uh, go with someone with some knowledge and take precautions. And so uh, what's the grand vision for the new shop? Can you tell us a little bit about what we're going to see? I think we're going to see more of the same of what we had, only we have a few collectible surfboards. I, I mean, I got into the to the sport because I loved surfing. And over the years, I've been able to find a couple really cool boards. I've always had a dream of having like some higher ceilings where we could show them off. Like, So I think you're going to see that almost have like a little history museum aspect you know would be really cool i think and just more of the same as far as the shop goes hard goods soft goods beach goods and continue to do what we do i mean so much of uh our beautiful state is you know survives on tourism and not a lot of people think that surfing you know is top of mind you know with compared to mount washington or the white mountains and these sorts of things but you must feel it what's What's the draw and what's the impact that you're having on tourism here in the state? It's pretty amazing. Like when there's a swell, like you can see, like when there, when there's a swell, like people come in from all over New England. And obviously we get a lot of people from Montreal because we're one of the closest areas for them to come and surf. The beach fills up, you know, the hotels, you know, the camping, 
the, you can see like the restaurants are there's the, you know the restaurants are busier you'll get hundreds of surfers in town swell and if the swell lasts a few days you'll get thousands of surfers and how's that make you feel i love it i just think it's great you know that people can enjoy the ocean and it's just so cool like you get there's so many people of you know all ages enjoying the water and it's just you know, there's nothing like it. I have a daughter and, you know, a couple of weeks ago we were out riding waves together and it's just so special. It's, it's, it's amazing. And it's, it's a great way to share great times with, you know, your friends and family. I think of course, uh, being in touch with nature and, and, and the ocean, it really makes us think about our own life and the fragility of it all. Uh, I know recently you've had some health challenges. You want to share with us what, uh, what happened? Oh sure, yeah. I had had a, I had had a uh, block carotid artery that I wasn't aware of. You know, I had some symptoms and was going to get it checked out, but you know, like we do, we push on and when we're busy, and and then, uh, yeah, then I ended up having uh, like a TIA, and they figured out I had a block carotid artery and I had surgery, and luckily I'm fine and don't have any any uh, any residual effects, but it was. It was really close to having, uh, you know, like a major stroke. Scary. Yeah, super scary when you talk about fragility of things, you know. And then, and then afterwards, like uh, we promoted on our website and stuff. There's a thing I guess called a uh, life scan, where you can go and get that checked out, where you can get your arteries and stuff checked. So as opposed to having symptoms and have it reactive, it's proactive. It's pretty pretty amazing, just so so that you know, because. I ate well. I felt I felt fine, but it was hereditary. You're the, you're the second person that's shared with me that a, a very similar story. Uh, just within the last couple of days, how did it uh, change your outlook and uh, your appreciation for for life and surfing? Yeah, I I think for sure you just you're. I've always been try. I've always been great. Try to live my life grateful. Like we always joke around. We're like uh, live each day, make each day the you know, or live live your day to the fullest and try to one up it tomorrow, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, so, but it does, it does, uh, yeah, just, it definitely put everything into, pers- you know, kind of puts everything into perspective. And I think that's, that's one of the things I think about surfing. That's pretty, pretty amazing is when you're, when you step off of land, a bit, you know, of all the chaos of, uh, and the busyness of land and you're in the water and you're just kind of at the rhythm with the, the rhythm of the ocean and, and you're riding waves. And when you think about it, you know, a wave is like lives its whole life, you know, you know, is made thousands of miles away and it rolls all the way to the shore, you know, and you meet it right as it crashes it, its energy. And then, so. Yeah. That, that connection with the flow and, and, and meeting it at that stage of its wave life is, is amazing. Right. And of course, you know, one thing that, uh, my mentor and good friend Warren Miller always said is with our ski tracks, our job was to make it prettier, right? Leave, make it, leave this place looking better for having it been there. How's that relate Absolutely. to surfing? Yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah. Uh, surfing's like that as well. Um, and there's some great organizations like Surf Rider Foundation. You know, we sponsor a lot of beach cleanups. I think everyone that's surfing, a big part of the, the a big part of the surfing isn't just riding waves. It's just, appreciating the environment you're in you you know everyone's pro pro uh pro you know clean water clean oceans and doing our best to keep the beaches clean do we have big events coming to the state are there are there pro type events do the pro surfers hang out here do we have any locals that have made it big there's no pro contest here but that we do uh we have actually done uh, you know, pre-COVID, we have had quite a few events where we've had some some of surfing's you know biggest names come through the town and either do movies or do meet and greets at the shop. And yeah, that's pretty special. And a few years back, we had uh, we did at the Portsmouth Music Hall, and it was a benefit for Surf Rider Foundation and the Eastern Surfing Association. Uh, we played. Uh, it was the 50th anniversary of the Endless Summer. Nice. And we had Robert August, who starred in it here live, and Wingnut, who was in Endless Summer too. And those guys were on stage. We did Q and A during the movie as well, so pretty cool. Yeah, no, that's 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 amazing. I love it when that stuff comes together. And 
of course, you were, you mentioned, you know, riding with your daughter and the connection. Talk about the family aspect of surfing and what you see in your customers and why they do it. I think it's a great way for everyone to enjoy the beach. There, and now, too, like you can get so, – there's so much accessibility for kids. And like last night, for example, I pulled up and my daughter was out with a couple of her friends and I got to watch her catch, just catch some waves and, you know, just to see that go. I remember when, you know, pushing her into waves when she was little and now she's out, you know, off surfing on her own and stuff as well. It's just a really great way to enjoy the water and enjoy the beach. And we're so, so fortunate to live where we live. It's a beautiful area to, to be and, and surfing here is, is, is pretty amazing. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, our shoreline is short but powerful, right? I mean, we really have an impact here and a role to play in ocean life and surfing and so much more. Uh, you're a major part of that. Does that feel good or what's that feel like to you? Oh, yeah, it, it feels good. I feel it feels so fortunate. And there's just so many amazing people in our community here. And yeah, it, it's, it's been great. And we have a guy, uh, Ralph Patello, who does a blog, Ralph's Pick of the Week. So it's like he's always taking amazing photos, like documenting all the swells and everything. And and it's funny because a lot of people are like, used to live here. They're like, I don't live here, but I stay in touch with the site and the blog. And, and they're like, I feel like I'm I'm still part of it, still part of the scene. Yeah, that's huge. And that blog is so popular. Just talk a little bit about about that education piece, that awareness piece that must be constant work, but so important. That's where the community is, is pretty special. Is there, you know, it's like everyone, every, you, you can meet people. If you see someone that's struggling in the water, you know, people will, will offer tips. It's a really, it's a really good way to go. Like I remember how, you know, how things were when I was a kid and I was starting to surf. And I remember like, you know, being not only welcomed, but then, you know, having these guys like as mentors, you know, and guys and women in the water that were like experienced and always treated you well. And it's like, I feel like I was treated so well and, and educated and passing it on as a tremendous, I feel it's a tremendous responsibility. And, you know, w when you think about that responsibility, the mix with tourism here in the state and the legacy of surfing uh, here in the Northeast, you know, when you package all that together, What's your end goal? What, what's going to be the legacy? Is your daughter going to take over the shop? What's what's happening now? I haven't really, I haven't really thought that through. I mean, I haven't really thought that through yet. As far as I know, just we're working right now as far as getting back to the beach goes. But I just want to ensure that there's a community shop on the beach for generations to come. And I think you know, I feel like the surfing community will continue to thrive and prosper and be a special place. It wouldn't be a beach without it, would it? No, right. No, I, I have to say, yeah, it's definitely, uh, it's pretty amazing. That's one of the really unique characteristics of the New Hampshire coastline is it has everything a beachfront should have, right? I mean, it's nostalgia, it's Americana, and it's services all packaged in a small place. It really is. And one of the biggest thing is our surf is accessible, you know, 1A drives right along the water, and there's plenty of parking. There are places in the world where it's a chore to get from surf spot to surf spot. We have sand bottom point breaks, rock bottom point breaks. It's a short coastline, but it's actually packed with a lot of a lot of great spots and accessible spots. You know, not to be overlooked, the accessibility, right? I mean, that is huge. And the fact that you can see it right in front of you, and like you said, you can find it. We're, we're definitely lucky. And uh, how about our friends in Concord? Do they recognize surfing as a marketing plus for the state? And are uh, they supporting you and getting behind things? They do. And, it, it, yeah, we've had a great relationship with the state. And surfing isn't, isn't you know, a secret anymore. It's, I would even go as far as to call, you know, our, our New Hampshire seacoast is like a surf town and a surf destination. Wow, that's something to uh, be proud of, Dave, really. And what what a thing that you've built and the community that surrounds it and supports it. Tell us how do people can find out more information. We are now located on Route 1 in Northampton, 62 Lafayette Road in Pioneer's former uh, location. And we'll be operating out of there till we are back to the beach. And we may even end up with two shops. We're not sure. 
Uh, in the meantime, you can go to our website at cinnamonrainbows.com. We have a live wave cam where you can check the surf, what's happening at the shop with events and such. And you can also book lessons and rentals online, weather and surf permitting from our website as well. I love it, Dave. A big part of the 603. And thanks for joining us here on the 603 podcast. Always a pleasure, Dan. Thanks so much. We'll see you in the water this summer, hopefully. Absolutely. Hey, thanks for listening to the 603 Podcast with me, Dan Egan. Make sure you check out our website at 603podcast.com. Please support the sponsors that make this show possible. And tune in next time, right here on the 603 Podcast, for more stories, tales, and exploration of the Granite State.